Bé, doncs procedim amb la jornada. Let's begin this uh, workshop. A good morning to you all. Thank you very much for being here with us today, as Jaume said, especially those who come from very far. It's always an effort to have to travel uh, in weekdays. We will now start uh, this uh, workshop with uh, the keynote speech by Jana meselhoff heresy She comes from Berlin, and then we will take a, a short break for coffee, and then we will continue with the international panel with representatives uh, from Croatia, Finland, uh, and Italy. We will have a break for lunch, and then we will continue with the local representatives, uh, representatives from the uh, Roman Sinti community in Barcelona. So. When we started to organize uh, this uh, conference with our colleagues from Novak, we immediately uh, thought uh, we had to invite uh, the German colleagues who have created the memorial space you see on the screen. Not only because of the dimensions it has, because it's uh, sizable, and uh, the location, as you can see, is just a few meters away from the German parliament, the Bundestag in Berlin, but also because of the symbolism this uh, memorial has. It is a tool for recognition and also for reparation, if that can uh, be considered possible uh, for a memorial uh, to the Roma and Sinti population uh, precisely at the capital of the Third Reich, uh, which was, um, well, who got the death of half a million people. And Jana Mechov, uh, Mechelthoff Heresi is the person who is best placed to tell us about how this memorial came into being. There are still some question marks about it, but Jana is a researcher. She's also an, uh, a teacher. Sorry, she's a researcher at the Memorial Foundation for the Murdered Jews in Europe, and she's also in charge of the Department for the Memorial for the Roma Sinti Population. And she's interested in the current situation of human rights and civil rights for the Roma Sinti population in Germany and across Europe. And she works to raise uh, the profile of uh, public memory policies in Germany addressed to repairing the memory of these persons, and she is especially interested in the task carried out at the different institutions within the education system in the anti-Romanism policies. Thank you very much. I give you the floor, Jana. Thanks for being here. So, yeah, now it's on. Yeah, I just start um, my little presentation that you have to see something during I'm talking. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear all participants, good morning. I too would like to welcome you. Many thanks for the friendly introduction, and it is a great pleasure and a, an honor uh, to be here today with you. When I read the title of the conference and who the organizer was, my first impulse was, yes, I really want to go there, the Memories of European Sinti and Roma Subaltern Memories Conference organized by the European Observatory on Memories and how I learned now on NOVACT. Yes, that sounded more than interesting for my context. This is one of the most harrowing realizations I have had during the 12 years I've been working at Roma and Sinti stories and with Roma and Sinti as persons. 
this high level of marginalization that they, their memories and their experiences continue to experience, both with regard to the history of persecution and genocide, but also with a, in regard to the human rights situation in the following decades up to the present day. I keep asking myself how it is possible, how it is possible that this largest minority in Europe is heard and seen so little, and what can be done to counter this invisibility. Today's conference is one answer to this. I thank you for the invitation. Before I talk in more detail about the memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma, allow me to say a few words about the institutional framework in which it is integrated. Although the institution I work for is called the Foundation Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, this title no longer reflects the actual work of the foundation. It was established in 1999 as an independent foundation of the Federal Republic of Germany for the establishment and subsequent operation of the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. In the meantime, however, a total of four memorials have been organized under this umbrella. Following the inauguration of the Holocaust Memorial in 2005, a memorial to the homosexuals persecuted and murdered under National Socialism was added in 2010. The memorial to the Sinti and Roma of Europe murdered under National Socialism was opened in 2012 and a memorial on an information site for the victims of the National Socialist Euthanasia murders followed in 2013. This is about those people who were murdered by the National Socialists because they were physically or mentally ill or only supposedly ill and therefore did not conform to the Nazis' ideal of humanity. Another memorial will probably be added next year to commemorate persecuted and murdered Jehovah's Witnesses. All of these memorials were erected as national monuments in memory of the respective victims and to provide information about the respective crimes. The maintenance of this mo these monuments and the work of our foundation are financed 100% from state funds. At this point, it is important for me to briefly address my position as a white, privileged person whose family biography is not affected by the National Socialist crimes and who has not experienced racism herself. It seems important to me to mention this because it means I can only speak from a very specific position. As reflective and empathetic as this position may be, it is that of someone who is not personally affected and therefore I cannot and will not speak for Roma or Sinti, but from an analytical and learning or listening, observing and solidary outside perspective. Out of this awareness, I always work, if at all possible, in my projects in such a way that members of the Roma and Sinti communities play a significant role in the conception and realization. In order to make the internal and affected pers perspective, including the transgenerational traumas, clearly visible and to avoid the narratives being appropriated. Let me also say something briefly about the use of the terms for the communities, which are the subject of today's discussion. There is no equivalent to Gitanos, as it is quite unproblematic in Spanish-speaking communities, or to Gypsies, as it is still sometimes used in English-speaking context. The German term Zigeuner was always a stigmatizing foreign term, term that served to construct the other worthy of rejection. The categorization of people as Zigeuner by the National Socialists at the latest, with the well-known consequences, means that the term can no longer be used in German. People who were deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau under this category were tattooed with a Z in combination with their prisoner number. I will therefore always use the double term Sinti and Roma, and if I use a historical source term, I will say Zigeuner in German. 
I have now talked um, in some length about the framework in which the National Memorial to the Genocide of the European Sinti and Roma stands and in which my work also stands. Please bear with me. It seems necessary for what follows. Before I actually talk about the memorial, I will briefly mention the most important information about the subject of this memorial, which is also necessary in the context of the memorial, about the genocide on the Sinti and Roma of Europe. These are less than two minutes basic facts. Among, among the many millions of innocent people murdered by the National Socialists and their accomplices between 1933 and 1945 were up to half a million Roma and Sinti from all over Europe, women, men and children. They lost their lives for a single reason, because they were who they were, Roma or Sinti. The National Socialist suffocated them in the gas installa installations of the extermination camps, executed them in mass shootings. Sinti and Roma died as a result of violence, hunger, cold, illness or ex exhaustion in ghettos and forced labor camps, or on death marches in the final days of the war. Thousands were abused for medical experiment, experiments or forcibly sterilized. This was preceded by systematic stigmatization and criminalization and the gradual exclusion from all areas of public life, the ban on the free choice of residents, confinement in camps and finally in Germany, the almost complete registration of citizens categorized as Zigeuner, which formed the basis for deportations. After the war, there was barely any public awareness on these crimes. The genocide was deliberately repressed and remained absent from public discourses. For decades, Sinti and Roma in Germany and other European states campaigned for recognition of the violent crimes committed against them as a result of a racist policy. The genesis of the memorial to the Sinti and Roma of Europe under National Socialism is closely linked to the decision to erect a memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. The initiative for this went back to demands from the German dominant society, primarily non-Jewish Germans. In the discussion about its erection, there were voices calling for a joint memorial for all victim groups. The Central Council of German Sinti and Roma also called for this. At the end of a long process in which there were other contentious issues, it was decided that the Holocaust Memorial should be dedicated exclusively to Jewish victims. The advocates of an argument based on the assumption that the murder of the European Jews was unique and not comparable with other crimes prevailed. That is the thesis of the singularity of the Holocaust. The compromise solution was that the Federal Republic of Germany undertook to erect further memorials to other groups of victims in the vicinity of the memorial to the murdered Jews. The fact, the fact that this national memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma of Europe exists today is primarily due to the tireless efforts of the communities and ultimately the Central Council of the German Sinti and Roma in particular. Sinti and Roma had to stand up for the interests themselves and had few supporters for a long time. In 1992, the German government expressed its first concrete intention to create a memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma. 1994, Berlin holds out the prospect of a plot of land. But this was just the beginning of a long and exhausting process. There was a, an early initiative by the International League for Human Rights, which is no longer widely known today, which for several years, from the mid-1990s, called for the immediate re realization of the planned memorial in an annual rally entitled Stones of, of Offense. This alliance gathered a broad range of supporters, federal politicians, especially, especially from the Green Party, individuals from civil society, including some prominent Jews, a group of Roma refugees from Serbia, and ind individual Berlin Sinti, including a famous survivor, Otto Rosenberg.
Every year from 1994 to 1998, the organizers erected a sign with the content you can see here on this picture. Each participant had to bring a stone from wherever they were coming from to fix the sign. At the time, there were successful attempts at disruption, particularly on the part of Berlin politicians. The memorial was not supposed to be too large, preferably not in such a prominent location next to the parliament building. It was feared that a memorial mile could be created that would make German guilt to be too ex explicitly visible in the center of the capital. As the League for Human Rights increasingly faded into the background, which with its demands, the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma began to fight for this is issue politically with demonstrations, petitions in front of parliament, open letters with the signatures of hundreds of survivors. Negotiations on important details of the memorial dragged on for a long time. One point of contention was the title of the memorial. Should it include the stigmatizing foreign term Zigeuner? One association demanded this. They wanted it to be called Memorial to the People Murdered as Zigeuner under National Socialism. The Central Council of German Sinti and Roma vehemently rejected this and eventually prevailed. If you look how and what was argued about there, there were obstacles where, where um, there were obstacles and um, how the public preser preserved them. <coughs> There's a lot to say for this. The Holocaust Memorial was also the subject of bitter disputes over individ individual issue issues. The public took a lively interest in this. The discussions were seen as a positive process and in some cases even as an immaterial part of the memorial in itself. The developments surrounding the memorial to the Sinti and Roma, on the other hand, met with little interest in society. And when the, discussion, and when the discussions were recognized, they were dismissed as an internal communication problem within the Roma and Sinti communities. It is also noteworthy that the negotiations were only conducted with two large organizations of the autochthonous national minority. The migrant Roma organizations from Germany were not at the table, nor were non-German European representatives of the communities. It was not until the memorial to the Sinti and Roma of Europe murdered under National Socialism was inaugurated in 2012 that the Federal Republic of Germany made a symbolic gesture acknowledging its responsibility for the victims of this genocide. 20 years passed between the initial idea and its realization. Many of the survivors who had fought for this battle did not live to see this day. One of the few of them to witness the ceremonial handover of the memorial to the public was Reinhard Florian. That is the small, dark gentleman in the center of the picture. His mother and 13 siblings were murdered by the National Socialists. Mr. Florian survived five forced labor and concentration camps. Apart from him, only his father and one brother survived. When Councillor Merkel thanked Reinhard Florian on the day of the opening, he said, now our dead finally have a home. The memorial ensemble was designed by the renowned Israeli artist Dani Karavan. Set in a clearing near the Reichstag and Brandenburg Gate, his integrated artistic concept works in harmony with the natural environment. Now I lost something. Where I am. Excuse me, I just have to find one page. <laughs> Here it is. No. Here I have to continue. 
In 1994, when the state of Berlin held out the prospect of providing the site where the memorial is actu actually located today, Dani Karawan was in discussion as the artist to realize the project. He was commissioned as the express, e express request of Romani Rose, chairman of the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma. Unlike unusual with such important commissions, there was no public invitation to tender. The initial landscape situation of the site of the future memorial was as follows. A small forest in the middle of Berlin's busy government district and directly on the axis, along with the streams of tourists, flow from the Brandenburg Gate, Berlin's most important landmark, to the Reichstags building where the German parliament has its seat. Caravan created the memorial here as a kind of oasis of contemplation, a space for silence and meditation, protected from the hustle and bustle of the capital by the 75 years old trees. I want to give you now an overview about the elements of the memorial so that you can get an impression how it looks like and how it functions. Uh, this is also like from his planning. So, in Karawan's design, a uh, triangular granite stone with a flower on it forms the center of the memorial ensemble. According to Caravan, the triangle is a quote from the angular inmate markings in the camps. This pedestal sinks down to the depth every day at lunchtime and is brought back to the first surface shortly afterwards with a fresh flower. Caravan wanted to ensure that the memorial was not static and eternally made of metal and stone. He wanted to add an element of living remembrance with a flower. The active action of a person is required every day for the memorial to function. In the middle of the clearing lies a circular lake about 12 meters in di diameter, consisting of a tub of dark coated steel, which surrounds the triangular, triangular granite base. According to Caravan's idea, the impression should be, be created that the lake is infinitely deep. He said, I had the idea that the memorial should be only one flower. But to protect the flower, I could have water. The water became an integral part of this memorial. The dark reflection on the water makes it look like a hole in the, er in the earth. Reflects the trees and the Reichstag, and anyone who comes close to the water becomes part of this memorial. This is very important to me. Everyone who comes is not only observing, but part of it. The flower is also very important because the Sinti and Roma are buried in huge cemeteries without graves, without signs, only flowers. We don't, we don't know where. Maybe only the roots of the flowers now. The flower is on a triangle representing the triangle they had to carry on their body. The moment they carried the sign, they lost all of their human rights as human beings. So this is the concept. The metal frame of the water bowl contains the poem Auschwitz by the Italian Roma musician, Romani poet and university teacher Santino Spinelli. In German and English, it lines the lake. On one corner of the memorial, it also can be read in two different variant, vari variants of the Romanes language, of the Romani language. Roughly broken stone labs are embedded in the lawn around the lake, whose shape is reminiscence of shards, destruction, fragmentation, loss, injury. Some of these plates contain the names of 69 places where extermination, concentration on collection sites were loca located or where executions of Sinti and Roma took place. On one side, towards the path from which visitors come, the memorial is bordered by a translucent glass wall depicting the chronology of the persecution and genocide of Europe, Sinti and Roma from 1933 to 1945. It also contains the entrance to the memorial, a gate made of rusty steel. 
there are two quotations on the glass walls facing the Reichstag building, the parliament. They represent milestones in the Federal Republic's recognition of the gen genocide. The first took place in 1982, 38 years after the end of World War II, by the Federal Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. I quote, the Sinti and Roma were seriously injured by the Nazi dictatorship. They were persecuted on race and racial grounds. These crimes have committed the crime of genocide, the Chancellor said. Within the monument space created by glass walls and planting music, an ever-changing violent tone, the piece Mare Manuschenge, what it is in Romani language, uh, Our People, composed by Fran Romeo Franz, can be heard permanently. Romeo Franz also played it himself for the recording, which is permanently sounding at the memorial. The violin tone follows a minor tone conductor, which is at the foundation of the traditional music of the German Sinti, and it is also char characteristic in modern Sinti jazz and Sinti swing. Romeo Franz's great uncle, Paul Winko Franz, was also a violinist. He was to deported to Auschwitz in 1943 and murdered immediately after his arrival. After this arrest, his family was warned by neighbors and fled, taking their most important asset, their instruments, with them. Paul Winko Franz's violin bow survived the family's odyssey across Europe. When it became clear that his great nephew, Romeo Franz, would also become a violinist, he inherited the violin bow. He played the recording of the piece Mane Maruschenge for the memorial in Berlin with this uncle's violin bow. Here you can see Romeo Franz next to a portrait of his great uncle, whose story is told in a supplementary exhibition next to the monument. Today, Romeo Franz is the first German Sinto to be a member of the European Parliament. So um, now we somehow leave the memorial itself and go to the complementary exhibition, which um, is next to it. Um, since it was opened to the public in October 2012, the memorial has become a crowd pillar for domestic and foreign visitors. Members of the mi minority as well as non-Roma use the memorial as a central place of remembrance. The great interest was in contrast to the widespread lack of knowledge about the persecution and murder of people from the Roma and Sinti communities. The lack of in-depth information was repeatedly lamented and a supplementary information center was called for. Without this form of information and without personalization, empathy with the victims was practically, pr practically impossible. The experiences of the first few years of the memorial's operation made it clear that it had a strong impact as a symbolic place of remembrance. The design by Dani Caravan and the music by Romeo Franz create the impression of the sacred place for some visitors, and the memorial is sometimes perceived as a symbolic burial site. This emotional associative level of experience was countered by the aforementioned lack of appropriate information. The chronology framing the memorial has some deficits. It only offers abstract, perpetrator-centered basic information. The people affected remain visible. It is strongly limited to the German perspective. The European dimension of the genocide remains largely un underexposed. And it ends abruptly with the year 1945, but the story does not end there. A further narrative about the immediate post-war years, the refusal of rec recognize the genocide and the denial of rep reparation for the victims and the continued discrimination and persecution throughout Europe seemed urgently needed. It is precisely these def deficits that the new supplementary exhibition aims to compensate for. The exhibition has two levels of content. On the one level, on the dark panels, 
the situation before the beginning of World War II and the persecution and murder throughout Europe are presented, organized according to thematic focus. However, the end of the war is not the end of the story. One panel shed light of the situation immediately after the war, after the end of the war, with another panel, while another panel entitled Refused Recognition depicts the emergence and struggle of the European civil rights movement of Roma and Sinti. The final chapter is dedicated to the memory of the genocide at various sites throughout Europe. The exhibition deliberately refrains from narrowing the depiction to an unbroken victim narrative. This would not reflect the reality. Especially among Roma and Sinti, there were countless acts of resistance and self-assertion in the face of marginalization, persecution and murder. On 16 May every year, we celebrate the International Day of Roma Resistance. The event that marked this day was the courageous and actually unthinkable uprising of the Roma and Sinti in Auschwitz-Birkenau against the SS on 16 May 1944. The SS wanted to kill everyone in the so-called Zigeuner family camp and imposed a camp lockdown. But the prisoners were warned. They armed themselves with stones, tools, ground metal objects into knife-like weapons and tried to defend themselves against the SS, with success for that day. Even beyond this unique and symbolically so important event, Roma and Sinti resisted and asserted themselves throughout Europe under the conditions of genocide many times, courageously, sometimes successfully and often without success but they tried. They did not accept what happened to them. They showed solidarity with each other, and when there was no one left, they tried to do it alone. Sinti and Roma fled from, camp from camps and ghettos, wrote protest letters against their arrests. They stole food to save others from starvation. In Poland, the courageous Alfreda Noncha Makowska saved dozens of children from the German occupiers. Others joined the partisans and fought underground against the Nazis. The number of Roma among the members of the Red Army fighting against the Germans was considerable. But it was not only the deadly circumstances of World War II that required resistance, courage and disobedience. In the years after the war and well into recent history and the present, Roma and Sinti initiated resistance to draw attention to injustice. All these stories are told in the exhibition Right to the Monument and a separate panel is therefore dedicated on this topic of resistance and it also runs through all the other chapters. <coughs> Resistance and self-empowerment uh, also, uh, also play a central role in the second level of the exhibition. This is formed by nine biographies which are depicted on the light-colored panels. They form the center of the exhibition. Here you can see the exhibition at night. The lighting causes the panels with the historical chapters to fade into the background. What remains are the large form and portraits which shine prominently into the nighttime darkness. The European dimension of the genocide of the Sinti and Roma becomes visible through the biographies. There are nine people, women, men and children. Three murdered, six survivors. They come from Germany, France, Austria, Poland, the Netherlands, Russia, Serbia and the Czech Republic. The youngest victim, Adam Yuivari, was the last survivor of his family of seven. After his parents and four siblings had already perished, doctors murdered him in a Viennese euthanasia clinic. He was only two and a half years old. At the age of one month, he and his family were sent to an Austrian concentration camp. He spent his entire short life unfree in inhuman conditions. 
of the survivor's portrait, only one is still with us. The well-known Dutch Sinto Zoni Weiss, who lost his entire family at the age of seven and later in his life faced up to his traumas, fought his way back to life and became a successful florist. He is now 86 years old and continues to report tirelessly about his story about the genocide of his people. Zilli Schmidt, a German synthetizer, also reported tirelessly until a few months before her death. She died in October last year, three days before the opening of the exhibition, at the age of 98. She lost almost her entire family in Auschwitz on 2nd August 1945, including her four-year-old daughter. Until then, she managed to keep all 13 persons alive by stealing food and medicine and having a pragmatic love affair with a prisoner functionary. Zilli Schmidt escaped from two camps. It was only at the age of 90 that she began to talk about her fate outside her family. She said of her motivation, our people should not be forgotten. I want the world to find out what happened to the Sinti. I want them to know what it is like to keep going on when you have lost everything you loved. Ah, so this is now the next. Um, there's an animated short film for each of the nine biographies. The films highlight a specific aspect of the biography in an artistic approach. They were realized in collaboration with international artists, screenwriters, illustrators, storytellers and musicians from Sinti and Roma communities. The screenwriter of the script for the animated short film about Adam Yuivari, the little boy I just mentioned, is Vicente Rodriguez Fernandez. Perhaps he is known uh, by someone here in this room. The director of all nine films is Hamze Betici, a Berlin filmmaker who comes from a Kosovo Roma community. These films are shown in media stations This is what is their lighting, uh, um, left and right. These are these media stations, and there um, you can see the films um, with the biographies. I have uh, these films with me today, and I would like to show you one of them so that you can get an impression of its approach, even if they are very different in their artistic style. I had thought about showing them at this point, but I think I will continue with my lecture, and um, then I will show them in the end before we go to the discussion. So. Um, now I say the last, um, the last panel is about the remembrance in, in Europe and I want to give you some examples of this. Today the genocide of European Sinti and Roma is only remembered at a few of the sites of the crimes. Many of the murder sites, above all in the former Soviet Union, are still unknown. It was only in the 1960s that survivors, relatives of the murdered, and other citizens began to re erect memorials. After the political transformation in 1989-1990, a large number of memorials or plaques were put up in unified Germany to remember deportations or local detention camps. In most cases, these were initiated and realized by independent Sinti and Roma organizations or other citizens against, engaged in commemorative activity. In many cases, the groups behind these memorials encountered fierce resistance. Roma, represent Roma representatives in the former Eastern Bloc states took opportunity of the newfound freedom after the end of the communist dictatorship to honor the victims. They often received support from artists and church, organization, uh, church, church organizations. In Western Europe, commemoration is likewise restricted to individual memorials. While progress has been made, the European dimension of the persecution and, gen and genocide of Roma and Sinti under national socialism still requires additional research and a greater public profile. I would now like to give you an insight into the memorial of the genocide 
into the memory of the genocide of the Sinti and Roma at different sites in Europe at different times. All examples are taken from the last chapter of the exhibition on memory in Europe. So here, this is um, in uh, Chernihiv in the Soviet Union, today Ukraine, and this was in 1959. Relatives from various places in Ukraine at a memorial site at a memorial service at the site of the shooting of her family members in 1942. This is a, a local recreation park by then. In the Soviet Union, there was no specific reference to individual groups victimized under the German occupation regime. Public remembrance only acknowledged peace-loving citizens. Roma and Jews were commemorated in private. <coughs> Here you see the Catholic cemetery at Shurova uh, in May 1966. Unveiling of the honorary grave dedicated to 93 Roma who were shot by German police and Polish gendarmes on July 1943. The memorial additionally erected on the site was the first in Poland to commemorate murdered Roma. The impetus for the memorial came from residents of Shurova, notably Christina Gill, a survivor of the massacre. A memorial plaque with the names and ages of those murdered was also added uh, to the site in 2014. In 1982, a memorial dedicated to 176 murdered Roma was erected in Alexandrovka near Smolensk in Russia. Survivors, relatives of the victims, and employees of the Moscow Roma Theater Roman campaigned for this mon monument. However, the inscription refers to the Roma shot by the German SS unit in April 1942 simply as peaceful residents. This is the only Soviet memorial to murdered Roma. After years of campaigning by the brothers Vincent and Oskar Rose, in 1973, a memorial was erected on the grounds of the former Zigeuner family camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Since 1985, the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma has held an annual event to remember the murder of the final 4,300 Sinti and Roma in the camp on 2nd August 1944. This ev event has played a significant role in raising international awareness of the genocide. In 2015, the European Parliament designed 2nd August as European Roma Holocaust Memorial Day. Amsterdam Museum Plain, November 1978. Unveiling of the Hell and Fire Memorial dedicated to the Sinti and Roma persecuted and murdered in World War II. It was the first memorial of its kind in Western Europe. It was installed of one, uh, on, on the uh, initiative of the survivor Coco Cospitalo. He's pictured um, left in the right, but this is also small. Um, and he was a representative of the Dutch Rom Foundation. This is uh, in Berlin, in the suburb Marzahn. Following an initiative of Berlin-Brandenburg, a regional association of German Sinti and Roma, in 2011, an exhibition went on display at the historic site of Marzahn detention camp, detailing the history of the camp in which a total of around 1,200 Sinti and Roma were held between 1936 and 1945. Since 1990, commem commemorative events have taken place here in June each year. And here uh, we have uh, the place Kalinivka in Ukraine. Uh, this picture is from October uh, 2019. A memorial is unveiled as part of the project Protecting Memory run by the Foundation Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe. 1943, a total of 32 Roma were shot in a barn on the site, which was then set on fire. 
A wooden cross put up at the end of the war disintegrated over time and the site became uh, overgrown. Prior to 2019, there had been nothing here to recall the crimes. <coughs> And this is Letty uh, in the Czech Republic, and the picture is from May 2016. The civil rights activist Josef Mika at the historic site of Letty concentration camp, where more than 1,300 Roma and Sinti were interned from 1940 to 1944. From 1971, the site was used for an intensive pig farming. For many years, Mika and his fellow campaigners have been calling for a fitting form of commemoration to be established on the site, and they have received growing support from Czech and European civil society. A memorial stone was placed here in 1995, but the Czech government did not purchase the plot until 2018. A memorial site created by the Museum of Romani Culture in Brno will be inaugurated in 2024, next year. So, um, now, as uh, a uh, penultimate point, let me say something about the memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma as a political site. When the memorial was opened in 2012, the expectations were different. When I talk about the expe expectations raised by the erection of the monument, I would first like to recall the following important sentence from Chancellor Angela Merkel's speech at the inauguration of the monument. Sinti and Roma still have to fight for their rights today. This is why it is a German and a European task to support them, wherever and within whatever national borders they live. This statement by the Federal Chancellor has created, confirmed and legitimized expectations. The expectations that such a memorial would point beyond itself. The expectation that it would heighten the awareness for the observance of the rights of Roma and Sinti in Germany and for the granting of equal treatment. The expectation that a commitment to responsibility alone could not be everything. Against the background of these expectations, the following occurred in May 2016 at the memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma, the site of Germans' symbolic acknowledgement of responsibility for the genocide next to the Reichstag building. On 22nd May 2016, close in time to the International Romani Resistance Day, a group of Roma, around 50 people, hoped to achieve self-resident status occupying the memorial. They came from countries in the Western Balkans and were under immediate threat of deportation to their supposed safe countries of origin. Among the occupants were adults who have been living here for a long time and children who had been born here uh, in Germany. Negotiations lasting several hours took place between politicians, representatives of the Central Council of German Sinti and Roma and the Memorial Foundation on the one side and the protesters' spokespeople on the other. Achieving the goal of the occupation was hopeless, but in their desperation, the people were not prepared to leave the site. The other side insisted that the place of remembrance of the murdered should not be instrumentalized for current political purposes. No compromise could be found. In the end, the police cleared the site at around midnight. I was present at the memorial that night, and that was one of the most difficult hours I've ever experienced. <coughs> I also want to take this occasion um, to inform you, dear participants, that the memorial to the Sinti and Roma of Europe in Berlin is in an imminent danger. The Deutsche Bahn, the German trail uh, company, train company, is putting pressure on the Berlin Senate to approve a new S-Bahn line directly under the, mo the memorial. Here you can see the um, planning. Um, 
For this, old trees on a large scale would have to give way, which are central to Dani Caravan's artistic vision. Without these trees, the unique atmosphere and tranquility of the memorial site between the Reichstag building and the Brandenburg Gate would be permanently destroyed. For the Sinti and Roma min minority, the memorial is a sensitive place of mem remembrance the victims suffering and their own loss, a symbolic grave. Are we allowing the interests of the Deutsche Bahn legal successor to the Deutsche Reichsbahn, which transported the victims to the concentration and extermination camps to destroy the memory of the dead? If this happens, it is irrevocably destroys the memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma of Europe. It, dishon it dishonors the victims, the survivors, and uh, their descendants. It fundamentally attacks the commitment of German society to the memorial of past crimes. It is not the task of the affected minority to look for alternative solutions, but the moral and political obligation of all Germans to stand up for the integrity of the monument. The Berlin Senate should not take any further steps until a route is found that leaves the monument untouched in its entirety. Zoni Weiss, who I uh, introduced already to you, he said, My father, my mother, my sisters and my little brother were murdered in Nazi extermination camps and have no grave where I could go and lay flowers. A place where I can stand still and be with them in my thoughts. This is a great loss. I consider it, it, I consider it this memorial to be my family's grave. I call on those who are planning the route of the new S-Bahn to take into account the wishes of the Sinti and Roma community and beyond. The only good solution is an alternative route so that the memorial is not damaged and peace is guaranteed. Leave our memorial untouched so that our dead might find their eternal rest. Finally, I want to look to the future. There is, a current, there is currently a, li a lively debate in Germany about the change in the culture of remembrance. There are rightly calls for it to become encrusted with symbolism and self-referential. Some of the points of criticism are that the current culture of rem remembrance offers no or insufficient space for the grief and anger of those affected and ignores the perpetrators. In Berlin, a network of artists, journalists and academics from, a diver from very diverse communities has been providing repeated impetus for a radical change in the culture of remembrance for the around three years. The network is called the Coalition for Pluralistic Public Discourse, CPPD. I am loosely associated with them and follow their work with great interest, regularly taking away valuable impulses from it. I would like to briefly introduce one of the CPPD's projects here. This is the Dynamic Lab Memory Lab Codes of Memory in Sinti and Roma Communities. In summer, the CPPD launched this lab, a pilot project and temporary exhibition module that makes the various dimensions of plural cultures of remem remembrance visible. Following on an open laborato laboratory character, the Dynamic Memory Lab developed its content explore exploratively and reacted on the dynamics of memory cultures as a spatial intervention. The project is process-led, expandable and changeable, just like memory itself. It creates a place to communicate and recognize individual stories and historical events that often receive too little attention in the political discourse on remembrance. The lab was opened on 2nd August 2023 in Berlin on the topic of codes of memory in Roma and Sinti communities. Under the curation of Hamza Butici, who I al already mentioned as the director of the animated short film biographies, codes of memories from the Roma and Sinti communities were made visible, remembered and reconfigured in the exhibition context. Uh, 
As bearers of memory, visitors were invited to reflect on their own codes of memory, to tell stories, and to locate them within the framework of a pluralistic society. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my speech. Let us look forward together to the direction the culture of remembrance will take in the coming years. I hope it will be pluralistic and honest. Remembering persecution and genocide cannot and must not be comfortable. Let us work together to build such a culture of remembrance for the future. I thank you for your patience and attention, and um, I want to show you now, I don't know, what do you say? Um, one of the short films, it is six minutes, um, and um, I just, um, this is the film Listen, about the survival of Lydia Krilova from Alexandrovka. I already talked about uh, Alexandrovka when I showed you the memorial sites in Europe. And I just want to issue a trigger warning um, at this point. The film tells the story of how the young woman survives because she protests against her own execution in a mass shooting. The film is abstractly drawn, but it illustrates the crime in a clear way. This is a hard truth. This is my truth, what I saw that day, what they saw. Day breaks with bootfall in your bedroom, the shapes of men and dogs, guns and insignia in the half-light bring hard words, and they pull me roughly by the hair, downstairs, through the kitchen, past last night's teacups and spoons. On the floor, the boys' trains kicked aside. My nightgown slips from my shoulders as I'm pulled into the street and then into the field where the men dig in sorrowful spades and the women scream until there is no more screaming. The silence rings out. I was born in Smolensk, the place they call the Black Soil. This is Alexandrovka. It's 1941. My ankles are dusted with soft earth, and I can't yet feel the bruises. I know now that they will come tomorrow, and tomorrow. None of us belong in this field at this blue hour. There were no Russians from the Kolkhoz, just Roma. Smolensk Roma, Chukino Roma, almost 200 Roma, and eight men with guns. Soldiers wearing skulls. Bare-toothed dogs on chains. The Russians left at home. The Roma digging pits. Einsatz commandos in black. Gunships. Yes, everything is clear to me again. I tell a soldier my father is Russian, and he lifts my gown a little with his rifle. He says I have good skin, pouts his lips at me. I said, yes, yes, I have papers, good papers, good Slavic skin, please. And so he sent me back to find them. Schnell, schnell. Letters, birthday cards, my nephew scribbles. I can't think clearly. I cannot find them. I run upstairs and find Maria, my sister, cradling her boy, alive. All of us crying quietly together, crying so quietly. I remember how small my voice felt inside my throat and I said you must run now downstairs the door hammers or there were more gunshots and only our eyes speak a language of escape insistent please go in the morning the earth is marbled with blood the soldiers are gone and the people are gone the tops of the two pits are harrowed with broken earth, clothes they stripped us of charring beside. This place holds truths as hard as grandmothers fell to their knees, and mothers held their stomachs, their children, each other. This is a retelling, 
The lake beside reflects the still sky in witness. Yesterday's screams and this silence. Equally loud. In the morning, the curtains of certain houses opened with relief onto the bare fields. Our neighbors once farmed this coal cause together. For Stalin's constitution, we fed our cattle and worked the grain, shoulder to shoulder. We wheeled our barrows, waved at one another as we passed. Our children played skip rope. By night, we drank and danced. But this was yesterday. This was before. In the streets that morning, certain doors stood wide open. These were the doors to the houses of the Roma. Some of them glimmered with blood. Yes, it was the curtains of the Russian houses that opened that morning onto the bare fields. And in the half-light, the greenhouses' ghostly glass creaked. The herd had not settled, far too fearful of sleeping. But it was the Roma who were murdered. It wasn't the Russians or their children who were thrown alive into the pits onto the twisted, bloody bodies. Oh, in a heartbeat, these false friends told the German officers, they are the gypsies, take them, not us. Many nights I have wondered, how could they return to their beds, knowing, listening to the gunshots blast away, life by life? And how could they look their neighbors in the eyes, their neighbors, workmates, friends, and lovers? How could they look them in the eyes, the Roma who came slowly from the woods, shivering, stunned, alive? I too survived. My sister Maria and her boy escaped and lived. 176 Roma were murdered in Alexandrovka that day. Men, women, children, babies, born and unborn. What they saw that day, what I saw, these are hard truths. This is my truth. Listen, how the wind rushes through the trees. Thank you very much, Jenna, for your presentation, for showing us this whole journey of the creation of this federal memorial in Berlin and for explaining the problems that you'll be facing in the future and will be paying close attention to this situation. It's worth remembering that this type of memorial is an inspiration to open up the memorial policies in the academia and in politics because we defend this plurality at the European Observatory on Memories. I remember when we visited this memorial one or two years after it had been inaugurated. It was quite impressive, and it then sparked this idea of um, making an effort to give voice to this plurality of memories that we defend and respect. So thank you once again, Jana. And now we will have time for questions from the audience. The floor is yours. Microphone, please. 
Hi everybody, I'm Chiara Nencioni, I come from Italy and I study Porrimos or Samora di Pan. I'm not Roma or Sinti, but I just uh, study them with the great passion and the emotion. And I would like to add something about memory places in Italy. I work with Santino Spinelli, you mentioned, and uh, um, in um, October 1918, um, we opened the first memorial um, in uh, Lanciano. Lanciano is a small place uh, um, close uh, between uh, Pescara and Chieti, so in Abruzzo, is in the center of Italy. And this monument is the first one in Italy. There is uh, an inscription that is the same that you have in Berlin, so written, the poetry written by uh, Santino. And uh, it is made by a particular stone that is a Maiella stone, because Maiella is the mountain close to the place where concentration camp in Agnone was. And as after the liberation of the camp, after the armistice in uh, September 1943, many Roman escape from the camp, going up the mountain, and um, they, some of them, uh, decide to be partisans against Nazi fascism. So that's why the um, stone, and the. Um, it represents a woman with a child trying to escape, and there are um, wired. They are wired like the with the same um, wire that was around the concentration camps, and every year in October, but also on the um, 16th of May and on the second of uh, August, there is a celebration just uh, uh, in the, um, just in front of the, this monument. And second thing, according to a European uh, uh, project called Memors, it started in 2012 and it was renewed this year. Um, the, some uh, university scholars uh, and some activists uh, put three labels where concentration camp for Romans, fascist concentration camp for Roma and Sinti were. There is one called Prignano sulla Secchia that is in the north part of Italy. It was a concentration camp devoted only to Rome and Sinti, in particular to Sinti, but now there is no trace where the place was. We only know where uh, the place was, uh, but uh, there is no memorialization apart of this label. And uh, two more one, one in uh, Tossicia and the other in Agnone, that are in the middle of Italy, Abruzzo and Molise. Tossicia was a concentration camp, uh, not only for Roman Sinti, ma but the majority of them were Roman Sinti. And Agnone was a Roman Sinti concentration camp only for them. And it was uh, in a uh, um, monastery, <laughs> so ruled by the church. And it was discovered just in 2018 because a, uh, uh, a high school teacher uh, working with his pupils asked uh, the pupils to uh, talk with the grandmother, grandfather to reconstruct the story of this place, uh, of their small town. And so they realized that uh, where now there is a, a, the, um, a kind of a house for ancient people, recovery for ancient people, and in the 19th century there was a monastery. In the middle, during the fascist time, there was a concentration camp. So one uh, survival went there in May 2018, and we put a, a label on this building. And last year, in the um, Memorial Day, that is uh, the 27th 
of January, and I would like to talk about this also. Um, we put the first uh, stoppage time. Uh, uh, Günther Demling went to uh, Trieste. Trieste is uh, in the northeast of Italy, and it is a special place because the Russian law uh, uh, were um, they claimed from uh, Trieste place. And just uh, in the middle of the main square in Trieste, we put the first in Europe, Stoppelstein, for a Roma deported. He, he was called Romano Eld and was a violinist, uh, like the one you talked about. And he was uh, deported with uh, all the, uh, his family in a concentration camp. He was only uh, 17 years old, and uh, the family was exterminated. He survived uh, two years after the liberation from the concentration camp, came back to Trieste, trying to survive uh, playing his violin in the square. But he lived only two years because he was very sick uh, because of the bad com living condition in concentration camp. And so there was a problem because, um, you know, a stop in a stop sign is written, here lived, or he was arrested, something like this, but he was Roma, so he had no uh, fixed house. And uh, he was not arrested uh, in a particular place, but when he was trying with his family to escape. So for the first time, we decided to written on the Stoppelstein, he played, <laughs> because it was a place where he, he were, um, was used to play violin. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And is there any other question from the audience? No? Everyone is waiting for coffee. No, I have a question for you. Um, no, it's a very specific question about the, the, co mm, the complementary exhibition outside the, the memorial itself. Um, you said you are showing nine biographies now there. Is it uh, in your plans to change the biographies at a certain point? I mean, you've been doing a lot of research on, on, on different uh, life stories. So, no, this is an interesting question, but we, um, at the moment we don't have the plan to change them because uh, also to decide th um, they are somehow balanced, um, th the number of murdered persons and survivors. Of course, it's easier to tell and find stories if persons survived. Um, the murdered don't talk, and um, in some cases whole families were murdered. Um, and, yeah, there should be women, men, and children, and we wanted to have this uh, European balance so it, and to to to, to talk um, really we don't have a high number of European biographies we are really rich in German Sinti stories that I, I would have like a, a good collection to to change them but to keep this European balance um, this is not a concrete plan but a good idea in every case yeah thank you alguna pregunta més del public do we have any further questions from the audience? If not, we can now enjoy a coffee and we will be back here at 12 on time. Be here on time, please.